All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Vince Malari. I am the program manager for the UCLA uh, Extension Architecture Interior, uh, Interior Design Program. I just want to welcome all of you to tonight's open house. So tonight, you'll have an opportunity to learn about our program and hear from the various people involved, from students, graduates, faculty, and the staff. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the night, and we will also have a drawing for a free class, so make sure you stick around for that. So I'd like to begin tonight by introducing our first presenter, the director of the ArcID program, Jeffrey Daniels. And <laughs> absolutely. And just to give you a little bit of a background on Jeffrey, originally from New York, Jeff moved from California, or moved to California to work in the office of Frank Gehry. He later started his own architectural practice and has built numerous projects, including the David Hockney residence the Broad Studios at Cal Arts and the award-winning KFC building on Western Avenue, which was included in the Getty Museum show called Overdrive, LA Constructs the Future. Since coming to UCLA Extension, Jeff has been an innovator in the field of educating interior architects and was responsible for creating the Master of Interior Architecture program that we now offer in collaboration with Cal Poly Pomona. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Daniels. Thank you, Vince, and welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to see uh, such, a, such a full room tonight. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a brief overview of the program. And then you're going to hear from uh, one of our instructors. You're going to hear from uh, one of our current students, uh, one of our graduates, and then from our program advisor, who will give you a little bit of the nuts and bolts of uh, how to get started. And then we're going to have a, a, an open uh, Q&A uh, that you guys can, can ask about uh, whatever, you, whatever you feel like. So um, with that, uh, we're going to start. And so uh, as you may already know, uh, our program is a, is a two-phase program that ultimately leads to a Master of Interior Architecture degree that we offer uh, collaboratively with Cal Poly Pomona with their architecture department. And um, many of you may uh, be asking yourselves, well, uh, what is this thing about interior design, interior architecture, and what the heck is the difference? I, I don't get it. And so uh, l let me see if I can try to hel help you out with that. The, the whole idea is that the professional interior designer is someone who has special experience with doing uh, interior spaces of buildings, and uh, there is naturally a, an, an affinity between the building itself, or what we sometimes call the shell, and all the detailing and enhancement that goes into the interiors. And the unique thing about interior architecture is that what we're doing is we're training interior designers who are focused on the uh, enhancements to the interiors, we're training them to think like architects. And this is really the key to our program, is that we're giving people the skills and the knowledge to uh, create the interiors for buildings, but they're coming at it from the kind of conceptual understanding of the architecture itself. And we feel this is really important, and it's, uh, it's a unique skill set that uh, only a few programs in the country uh, have really taken on, and this program uh, happens to be one of them. So interior architecture is rooted in the idea that the creation of interior space has an in intrinsic al allegiance to architectural thinking. And as I was saying, this is really what our program is all about. Now, another thing that's very unique about our program is it is ideal for those of you who may be thinking about uh, shifting careers or changing careers. 
Uh, it is the only Master of Interior Architecture program in the country that is offered on a continuing education basis. And what this basically means is you do not have to be a full-time student. You can have a job, you can uh, uh, take care of, many of you I know have family responsibilities, and you can do all that and go to our program uh, at whatever pace uh, is comfortable for you. So some of, you, some, some of our students go through it, you know, essentially full time. And of course they can go much faster, but some of you uh, can take your time and go through it at a pace that, uh, that suits you. And there's no, absolutely no penalty for that. Uh, in fact, if you are actually working in the industry while going through the program, it actually becomes a big asset. And that's what many of our students are, are doing. Um, so what are some of the other benefits of the program? Well, um, one is that it offers the highest credential, the highest professional credential you can earn in the interior design industry. And um, not only does it offer that high credential, but for those of you who may consider the possibility in the future of teaching, and you know, we'll talk a little, you're, you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, it is uh, basically the, the credential that you need nowadays to be able to uh, have a teaching position at a university. Uh, all of our classes, uh, although we d this is a partnership with Cal Poly Pomona, all of the classes are about two and a half blocks from this building, just a little bit north uh, on Westwood Boulevard at a building called 1010 Westwood, which is just below the main UCLA campus. And so uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful building. I urge you all to uh, go by and visit it uh, whenever you have time. And uh, you'll see that the building itself is a little bit like a textbook. And what I mean by that is the building itself is, is, is a, a series of examples of how to build creative interiors uh, uh, in ways that make the spaces not only functional, functional but, but really kind of fun and exciting to be in. Um, we are also uh, CETA accredited. Now, not all, CETA may not roll off your tongue like something you would talk about at home, but it stands for the a Council for Interior Design Accreditation. It is the gold standard for interior design programs in North America, of which there are, uh, I believe now, over 150 programs. We are one of the oldest programs uh, to be accredited by CETA. We've been accredited for over 40 years, and we're very proud of that. And as you, you know, maybe uh, shop around and compare us with other possible programs, you know, that's a question you should be asking is what, what accreditation do those programs carry because not, not all of them are CETA accredited. Uh, I think one of the most important things about our program, and you'll hear a little bit more about this as well, is the fact that all of our instructors are practicing professionals. Because of the nature of continuing education, we don't have full-time tenured professionals. And it's not to say anything, not to cast aspersions on, on tenured faculty. There's a whole slew of them uh, a few blocks north there on the main campus. But um, there it can be, when you're in a professional program, uh, a huge advantage to having people come in from the industry who are doing this kind of work day in and day out, teaching these classes. And that's exactly what we have. And so there's a kind of immediacy and an excitement to every one of our classes because of that immediacy, because of the people that teach you or the people who are doing this stuff every single day. They're not people who are just you know, sitting in academic offices uh, grading papers or writing books and stuff. They're actually out there doing this kind of exciting work and sharing that experience and that knowledge with our students. Um, Another fantastic advantage is our open admission. Uh, as I said earlier, the program is divided in two general sections. The first section we call the certificate program, the foundation level, and that is a prerequisite for the uh, advanced section or the master's degree, which is the final half of the program. The first half you can enroll in at any time with or without a, uh, uh, a bachelor's degree. And um, it's a terrific way 
to get an idea of whether going back to school or being in this kind of a program is right for you. You can just take one class, see if it's a fit for you, and then decide what you want to do next. To go on in the master's level, in the advanced program, you do need a bachelor's degree, and you do have to submit portfolios and stuff like that. But the good news is, if you go through the prerequisite part of the program, uh, you'll be almost guaranteed to get into the advanced program because we teach you everything you need to know to get accepted. Um, it's terrific because of the flexibility of scheduling, going back to the fact that many of you uh, work or and or have family responsibilities. And so uh, classes are offered uh, most evenings of the week. And um, you can choose to take one class or uh, as many as three classes. We don't recommend taking more than three because it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, but that flexibility is a, is a powerful thing for those of you who do work. And again, uh, saying that we are the only master's, Master of Interior Architecture program in the nation that is offered on this basis. Uh, we also, and you're going to hear more about this later, have a fantastic internship and job placement program. 95% of the people who graduate from the program already have uh, uh, the job offer they've dreamed of before they pick up their certificate or their diploma. And that's pretty exciting because we know that's really why you're here. And so we make it happen. And lastly, uh, the value. And the best way I can uh, uh, demonstrate that for you is to just check out what uh, our competitors are, are offering and what that costs compared to what we offer. And I think it'll be immediately obvious to you uh, the tremendous value that we do, that we are providing. So, um, you know, a little bit about our philosophy of teaching. You know, there's no one best way of teaching design. We, we embrace many modes of design, uh, both traditional and contemporary, though we do le lean more towards uh, the commercial design world. But we have many, many students who go on and become uh, successful uh, residential designers. And there's probably no place better in the world to be a residential designer than in Los Angeles because of these gigantic homes that people seem to still have around. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we encourage our students to uh, have a lot of criticality in their thinking, a lot of creativity and imagination, and above all, to be playful. Because that's, you know, if you're not having fun with what you're doing, what you're doing probably isn't that much fun to be in or look at. So it's important that the designer is enjoying the process in order for the people that later on will, you know, be inside of your work to uh, similarly have a great feeling about it. Um, I've already mentioned that our, our teachers are mostly practicing professionals, and I can't overstate the, uh, you know, the, 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 the immediacy and the excitement that that brings to the classroom. Um, and uh, I think that uh, you can look at the, at the catalog for more detailed description of all the classes, but we take you through a whole uh, a journey from uh, a historical point of view, teaching you how to uh, uh, understand modes of composition, both in two dimensions and three dimensions. And you know, one of the biggest fears of all, some people think that the biggest fear of all is, is public speaking. And I know that uh, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a belief out there that pu people fear public speaking more than death. I don't know how many people have heard that. But you know what people fear even more than public speaking is they fear that they don't understand how to draw. And so uh, we have here tonight with us uh, someone who's going to share his, his, his mystical wisdom with you. Uh, but he is. Um, teaches our drawing classes, and he's going to explain to you how, for those of you who have anxiety around drawing, uh, we're, going to, we're going to help you out with that. Because we, we know how to teach people to draw. Uh, I, I don't want to say like Leonardo, because that's a little bit silly. But, but we can teach you to draw with authority, 
and with imagination and with, with confidence. And, and those, are, those are the skills that you really need to be successful as a designer. And, um, and you're going to also hear more uh, in, in a little bit about uh, how we help people with job opportunities and placement, because that's, that's really where the rubber hits the road, and, and we take great pride in our success in that, in that area. Um, our, our graduates go and work for all the top firms. You can see these names here from Hirsch Bedner, HOK, Gensler. These are the, these are the greatest uh, world-class firms in the world. They, they either have their main headquarters here in LA or they have a, a major uh, satellite here in LA. And uh, many of our students uh, go on to not only work in those offices, but to get assignments all over the world and to travel the world you know, as a designer, whether it's in uh, commercial work, residential work, hospitality is very popular. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to the wizard of drawing. It's Larry Drayson who teaches our, our both uh, on the ground and online drawing classes. And he's going he's gonna, to uh, tell you why you don't have to worry. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Wow, future interior designers of America. Look at all you out there. Very inspiring to see you here, and I'm very proud of you. I don't know how or what fate brought you to this classroom tonight, but I'll tell you a quick story. Years and years ago, I was a student or a prospective student sitting in these chairs myself. Uh, not at the school, but I ended up at an open house, and I got to hear what adventures could possibly be for a career, something that I was like yearning to find out where was my purpose in life. And Aristotle said that a person's aptitude and society needs where they meet, you find your profession. And I was very happy when I started hearing about the design field that I would find my profession as a designer. It's a very exciting field and I'm just proud that you all came to, to do this. And as uh, Jeffrey spoke a little earlier, um, we, have, we have drawings as a foundation for this program. And you don't need to have any drawing skills to enter this class. People say, I don't have the skill or the talent. I'm not creative. Well, architectural drafting is a learned process. You don't have to be creative. You just have to follow the step-by-step -step instructions and follow the process and you will gradually go, this is after just a couple of short weeks, after 12 weeks, you're at this level. Uh, excuse me, after about 10 weeks, you're at this level. And when people are sitting in the classroom tonight and they're looking at this and they're going, I can't do that, I, I cannot do that. Well, the way I teach the course, the brain has two sides, a right and a left hand side. And once we can train you to, uh, at, get into the creative thinking side of your brain, it becomes a very learned step-by-step -step process and you get over that fear and that anxiety of drawing. So I will assure you that students that entered my class, they, they, they see these examples and they go, you know, raise your hand if you have drawing anxiety. Okay, come on, <laughs> be honest. And if you do, you'll just know that it gradually will slip away as you uh, take the course. And it's, it's a very uh, fun process seeing you develop and your friends and your family see the skills that you're picking up. It, it's like Jeffrey said, it's a very confidence building affair that you go through. So when, when the class, when we consider that it's process driven, I also try to instill in the students how to create success. And there is a, a learned process in being successful. You have to know how to be organized. You have to know how to understand the assignments. And then just step by step, you go through this with the right materials, the right drawing tools, and you find it very rewarding. And most important, it creates a foundation, a building block for the rest of the program that we go through. And this building block, even when you become a working professional, you never know when you're going to be in the field and you have to rely on those hand drawing skills. And Jeffrey Daniels, I give him a lot of credit over the years where other schools are going more, uh, you know, dropping the hand drawing and getting away from the skill of drawing. We all know as working architects and uh, professional designers that 
having the ability to communicate with a hand sketch so important and it's valued uh, by the big employers they the main because that's how you explore ideas that's how you solve problems as they come up and I do like the fact that I'm a working professional for many years I've uh, designed many hotels around the world in Hong Kong in Shanghai in the United States here in Redondo Beach and so I enjoy my profession every day I'm doing something new and exciting with uh, my clients and future designers, we create the vision for the future. So we're part of making everything evolve, and uh, that's why I think uh, it's important that Jeff said, you know, to be creative, because we have to help create the future. Okay? I'm going to just show you a couple more here. And uh, these different uh, architectural drawing types, these are how we communicate to the, to the um, carpenters, to the electricians, eventually to our, you know, with our clients. So we have all these marvelous tools, very powerful tools, because I say people, when you create a picture, you create a thousand words. So all the narration, the written language, it's all very helpful and communicative. And also, uh, later in the program, you'll be able to create 3D models with your computer. And if a picture takes, you know, is a thousand words, a model is like a thousand pictures. So. You know, we, we take these little building blocks and we go uh, into the future and we build on these classes. And even in the very first class, as, as much as we're not a design, interior design class in the, in the um, design communication drawing classes, because I'm a working professional, I give people a way to organize a presentation page. And even after, this is like only four weeks into the class and people are already getting what is the, the foundation of an orthographic projection? Plans, elevation, section. The ability to see three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. And at this point, we're going to turn it over to Christine. And uh, I'll be around later for some question and answers. But again, I'm very proud of you for coming and stick with it. You know, if you have a goal and you have an inspiration to want to be a part of this, you're going to find it to be very rewarding. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you so much, Larry. Doesn't he look like something out of Harry Potter, or like a wizard or something, I think? <laughs> anyway, um, he is a wizard, and, and you'll, you'll feel his magic if you, if you take his class. Um, next, we'd like to uh, welcome uh, a, one of our uh, certificate students. Uh, she actually just shared with me that she's only a few weeks away from graduating, and, and you know, uh, we sometimes say to students, you know, before you think about starting your own firm, you really should go out and work a little bit for somebody else. But some students are so driven that uh, they just can't, they don't have the patience for that. And uh, Christine sounds like she may be one of those students, so she's going to share uh, some of her experience with you. Please welcome Christine Zippert. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christine. And a couple of years ago, I was sitting where you are. Um, I had a very successful career. I was the senior vice president of a public relations uh, firm's West Coast office. I had a team of 25 people. I'd worked my way up the ladder, and I'd worked hard. And um, I had it made by a lot of counts. Um, but I had gotten so far away from the creative side of me, I had a BFA in painting, and I found myself sitting in executive rooms and, and working on the business, and I hadn't drawn in years and years. And so I felt like I needed to find a better balance and something I could do where I felt really deeply fulfilled and something that was more tactile and something that let me use my business savvy, um, but also gave me the opportunity to use the right side of my brain again. Um, and so I uh, decided to enroll in UCLA's certificate program. I had tried to take a couple of classes while I was working in my big career, um, and I had been able to do one or two, but it's a lot of work. There is so much to learn. Um, I can't believe how many things you need to know as an interior designer because you're working with contractors and architects and so many trades and you have to know about all the materials and so I decided if I was going to do it I wanted to go big and I wanted to go after a real big career in interior design and so I quit my job we sold our house to make it happen and we took a huge risk 
risk and I'm lucky to have a husband who said okay and my two little toddlers came with me and it's possible you can do it I turned everything upside down and I am so glad I did it um, I took that risk and I worked hard and um, I have not regretted it for a minute even when I've been scared and I've been worried that maybe it's not gonna work out I've just put my head down and I've done the work and it is a lot of work you guys um, but it's worth it and these are skills you can't teach yourself on your own and there are wonderful teachers like Larry who help guide you along the way and now two plus years um, ahead I actually have had the opportunity to work on real projects. Um, my old creative agency, about halfway through this program, happened to be opening a new West Coast office, and I got to do everything from the construction drawings, all the space planning, the lighting design, the surface materials, and all the furnishings, and that was the first project. And I could never have done any of that if I hadn't taken these classes. Um, so Larry talked a little bit about what you'll start out with, and I thought I could show you what the work starts to look like by the time you get to the end of the program. Um, one thing I love about uh, UCLA's program is that it really does believe that drawing is the basis for everything. And I actually am working on a, a big remodeling job right now, and I was taking dimensions and starting the project off this morning. And I was in that house drawing and sketching and starting to create my design plans on the fly with a pen and paper. Um, but we also learn all about how to use um, all the compu computer programs too, which are really important. Um, so here's some hand drafting and hand um, sketching. And after you start to learn to draw, you add pen, you add uh, color, um, you start to draw in perspective and really think about what is a space going to look like. And as you start to draw it, you really figure out all of these little design issues that you have to solve. Um, so there's big conceptual issues and a lot of small ones too. Um, you also get to take color theory. The um, image on the far on your right um, is actually from color theory. So you learn how to use mat different materials to put color palettes together to start to really imagine material palettes and things like that. And you get technical, you learn what are the right fabrics in a commercial setting, a, a hospitality setting. You learn every kind of stone, you learn every kind of engineered product out there, and all of that stuff really helps you think about design holistically. Um, you also learn all of the programs you need to know. Um, I did have a arts background, although I hadn't used it in 12 years when I came into this program, but I had no idea how to use um, AutoCAD or SketchUp. There are Revit classes if you want to go that direction, which Revit is being used in a lot of commercial firms right now um, and, and residential. Um, and so these are some of the drawings. You learn how to do floor plans, you learn how to do elevations, you learn how to dimension and get it exactly right so that you can talk the talk with the architects and the contractors and everyone else that you come into contact with. Um, you also learn SketchUp. This was the first SketchUp class I'd ever taken. I'd never done anything like it and you take blueprints and actually build a building up from the blueprints and you learn so much about construction um, in doing it and also learn how to create beautiful renderings. Um, I took this class online and I did this from my bedroom and so it's really awesome that you can do that too. Uh, this what this you learn lighting um, lighting is so technical it's such a different part of design um, but for the commercial building that I put plans together with and that was my first project I felt equipped to put a lighting plan together and we you and there were very few tweaks when we went into construction because I learned it at UCLA um, and then you start to go into studio classes that are much more conceptual. I actually brought some of my work and it's back there. You can flip through it so you can see some of the types of work we do. And you will notice a lot of the work is um, hand drawing um, in addition to using the computer. And it's because there's so much conceptualization that happens by hand. Um, so this is a class for Studio One where you uh, have to design a hotel and you get to live and breathe the hospitality space and learn so much about space planning and concepting. Um, and then st uh, Studio 2 at the end of the program, I, I am just finishing, you get a two-story loft that you can break down all the walls and you design it for a client. So I brought back my um, SketchUp skills and my rendering skills and my auto AutoCAD skills and I was able to render out and, and create and design um, an entire loft space. Um, and so 
uh, that's a little bit of the work. I, I have zero regrets. I walked away from a huge career, and I think beyond being able to be on the path I want to be as a designer, and this might just sound so cheesy, but I'm just gonna say it, which is, I was so afraid of taking a risk. I just, even though I had a big career, it was stable, I knew what to do, I just kept doing it, and then I looked back 15 years later and was like, Where, how, how did I get here? And um, quitting it all and starting over has been great, and I'm not afraid of taking risk, and that's what's made me feel comfortable enough to take on my own projects while I've been in school, and um, I'm starting my own studio, and you know, we'll see where it takes me, and I'm, I'm open to a lot of different um, opportunities, and it's, it's just been a great experience, so that's it. Thank you so much, Christine, that was great. So um, to give you a little feel for what it's like after graduation, uh, we have with us uh, one, of our, uh, one of our graduates who also uh, was extremely driven and uh, decided to open up her own company. And not only has she been uh, uh, an amazing success with her own work, but she's actually now come back and teaches for us uh, uh, because, I don't know, she just misses us or something. <laughs> so please welcome Alice Quo. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm super excited to be here to share my experience in the interior design industry with you. I was an international student. So growing up, career option is actually already pre-decided from my parents. Doctor, lawyer, or everything else fail, accountant. <laughs> well, I was the everything else fail. Never been really good at math or science. However, at a really young age, I actually found interest in art, but never really get to explore it. So after graduating from UC Riverside with an accounting degree, I decide it's time to explore my creative side. So throughout my research for different many type of career, I come across interior design. So basically it's a job that combines the creativity of art and the functionality of human space. So if you really think about it, you actually get to create a living art for human to live in there and also interact with it. How cool is that? So after that, after that, I did quite a lot of research on figuring out which program to attend in Southern California. I wanted to make sure I find a program that will get the most of my financial investment. See, my accounting degree did not go to waste. <laughs> so a couple things I was looking for in the program. One is higher education. Since I already have an undergrad degree, I'm not really seeking for an AA or another undergrad degree. So this program offer a master's. Two is a comprehensive curriculum. So even though I found that I have interest in art, but I never really have any formal training. So here's the reality. I don't really hold my chopstick correctly. So forget about holding a pencil and draw something decent. So this program will actually teach you from drafting, color theory, all the way to your senior um, core classes, which is design studios. All of these classes are taught by working profession, and you're actually learning real experience what the professor get to deal with every day. Third, I'm looking for job placement and internship. So the program itself has a great relationship with many, many firms and also have a great reputation. However, our treasure in this program is our student advisor, Suzanne Shepherd. She is a wizard at job matchmaking. So she listens to your needs and actually fits you with the right firm. With her help, I'm able to actually complete three internships. My third internship actually hired me and sponsored my work visa. 
I feel until today that I owe her my life because of her, number one, I don't have to be deported. <laughs> Two, I, well, you know there's other option, right? Two, marry some random guy to be their foreign bride, 90 days fiance, in order to stay in this country. So thank God for Suzanne. <laughs> So here, you're not just a number in a university. Here, you're actually here to make a lifetime of connection. A lot of my professor are still actually mentors for, to me until this day. So I'm super grateful for that. So I would like to share a little bit about what happened after I graduate. So my first job is with a, a professor from our program in an architectural firm. After two years of training, I decided to take some time off and take my licensing exam. That's the time actually the housing market has crashed. So a lot of firm actually close shop or downsize. So job, design job are extremely limited. So my friend and I had a great idea why not start our own firm, right? Crazy idea. We didn't really have much expectation. We just wanted to make sure we keep up with our resume. When the economy comes back, we get to hopefully get hired again. So this is what my career ended up taking me. We start with decorating, very soon move to bathroom and kitchen remodel. And after that, we get to do addition and after that, the Chinese investor came in. We, get to we actually get to design a lot of large single family homes that range between 10 to 15,000 square feet. Four years later, my partner decided to relocate with her husband. So I have to start my firm all over again. This time around, I decided to take on the challenge and focus on commercial. Without any portfolio, without any very limited uh, knowledge, um, I started out with something small. Small little remodeling, and then along the way, learn more and more and take additional structural engineer class, project managing class. Then we get to move on to large tenant improvement project. Then 2017 comes along legalization of marijuana. <laughs> Somehow we found a niche in designing dispensaries. So far, we have completed 21 dispensaries, including retail, consumption lounge, education center. So I know what some of you guys are thinking. No, I don't get paid in weed. <laughs> so as our career continue to move forward, I seek more and more connection from structure engineer, experience builder, and developer. Now we get to design more and more exterior design, new construction building from shopping center to multifamily to condo development. A few years back, I had the opportunity to get invited back to teach residential remodeling. And I feel so honored that I get to share all of my working experience with students. In conclusion, I wanted to leave you with this. In the population, there are very few percentage of people actually get to find their passion in life and fewer get to turn their passion into a career. And all of you guys sitting here are that very, 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 very lucky few. So I hope to see you in this program, which will provide all of the tools that you need to turn your passion into a rewarding career in interior design. Thank you very much. Every time I hear Alice speak, I have to go, wow, you know, even though I've heard it before, I'm still going, wow. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Alice. That was, that was wow. Um, so uh, last but not least, uh, we're going to, you've already gotten a little kind of hint about it, I think, but uh, we're going to hear from the person who is usually acknowledged most by the most students by the time they finish the program as the one who made it all possible. And uh, she is our program advisor um, who helps students uh, work out their choices of classes, their schedules, uh, the order in which they do their classes, and perhaps most importantly, she helps them find internships and uh, places, helps place them in jobs. And so um, her official title is program advisor, but I usually like to think of her as uh, our own national treasure. <laughs> and that's, uh, please welcome Suzanne Shepard. Thank you very much, Jeb. Um, I have to tell you how I started. Um, I was a master training teacher for UCLA and I uh, got married to a very bombastic criminal defense attorney and <laughs> he moved me to Chicago. And so we were living in an apartment on the 27th floor of a building designed by the famous architect Mies van der Rohe. And we were right across from Lincoln Park and Lake Michigan. I really loved it there. I didn't think I would ever like Chicago after California and Los Angeles, but um, living there was great. No matter what the weather, I'd walk up Michigan Avenue, go to the Art Institute. Uh, for the first time, I sat in on art classes. I didn't know a soul. I just sat down with a sketchbook, a stick of charcoal, and I'd start sketching. And I thought, wow. I've really been missing something. Well, then we had five children. So <laughs> my husband was doing a lot of traveling with some very unusual criminal cases. And he was out in Los Angeles, and he called me one night. And he said, Suzanne, I want you and the children out here in Los Angeles by the end of this week. I said, you are kidding. I just got all the kids enrolled in schools for next, uh, the, the next semester. I signed a new lease on our apartment. He said, in one week, Suzanne, I want you out here. And I said, well, where are we going to live? And he said, I bought us a house. And I said, where's the house? He said, it's up in the Hollywood Hills. And I said, wow. How big is the house? He said, it's big, it's two stories. I said, well, how many bedrooms does it have? We need a lot of bedrooms. He said, don't worry, it's a two-story house. And I said, have you ever been in the house? He said, why would I have to be in the house? It's two stories, it's in the Hollywood Hills. We're gonna be right in the middle of everything, it'll be so exciting by the end of this week, Suzanne. So I packed us all up. We came out. I took a taxi cab from the airport, drove to the address up in the hills, and there was this house with all this dead vegetation all around it. It was two stories. Opened up the front door, and I went, oh my God. God, and the kids were going, cool. The house was painted all black inside. <laughs> there were strobe lights everywhere. I later found out it was a house of Sly and the family stone, <laughs> the acid rock group. And the pool man told me that one day he came and there was a body floating on top of the pool. <laughs> and he was glad to see that I looked somewhat normal. So <laughs> I got the kids all enrolled in schools and everything. And 
And I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I never lived in a house. I don't know where to start, outside, inside. And I thought, oh, God, if I'm going to invite friends over, the first thing they see is the exterior. So I was told about UCLA Extension, and I enrolled in the Landscape Architecture Program, which at the beginning I absolutely loved. However, I soon got to a required class, irrigation ditches and retaining walls. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is not fun anymore. <laughs> so someone said, Suzanne, why don't you try the interior design program at UCLA Extension? So I thought, well, what could I lose? The kids were in school. Maybe I could devote one night a week to going to those classes. So I enrolled in my first class, and it was the drawing and drafting class. And I brought my homework in the first week, pinned it up like all the students did. The instructor looked at it and went right by. No comment whatsoever. I was so crushed. The second week, I tried harder, pinned up my work. He looked at it, and he went, Hmm. And then he walked on. <laughs> the third week, I worked so many hours on that homework assignment, pinned it up. He said, well, now, this is something to talk about. And so I thought, well, maybe I found my niche here. We had to take our pencil drawings to be blueprinted for the final. And I was standing around waiting for my blueprints to be delivered to me. And an architect who was also standing around came over to me and said, is that your work? And I said, well, of course it's my work. And he said, well, are you looking for more work? And I said, well, and he said, well, how much do you charge? And I said, $25 an hour. And he said, no problem. And I had my first job. <laughs> and all I could do was draw and draft. I didn't know anything else, really. Um, but that got me started. Um, I hired uh, a man just walking through the aisle at Kuntz Hardware on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. Uh, he came up to me and said, excuse me, but you look lost. Can I help you? And I asked, can you paint? And he said, yeah. I said, come with me. I didn't even know his name. <laughs> Five coats of white paint to cover up the black. The children were really upset with me, but I was happy. <laughs> and so no matter what you're doing in life now, just like Christine and Alice have said, you can really find happiness by starting a new career in something that gives you fulfillment. Uh, once you get past the drawing and the drafting early parts, you begin to feel more free with it. You can even draw and draft with pen, and uh, then you go on to using color. So let me show you what my path was. Oh, wrong, wrong one. So this is the beginning of the program. It's a foundation level program. There are 18 courses, and each one of them is very, very important. If you can only take one class a week, do that. You'll eventually get to the end. But you should start probably with fundamentals of interior architecture. If you're at all curious, about what an interior designer does. In the fundamentals of interior architecture, you will have a guest speaker uh, just about every single week who has a special niche within the field of design. So one week you'll have uh, an expert residential designer come in who'll talk about what it is they do every day in their practice and what skills you would need to be a good residential designer. I still think it's psychology. <laughs> There's a lot of hand-holding in residential design. Um, then uh, the next week you might have a commercial designer. 
uh, someone who does a lot of office spaces, uh, work places. Uh, the next week you'll have a hospitality designer and learn all about what a person who designs hotels and clubs and spas needs to know. Uh, another week you'll have a lighting designer come in uh, and then uh, you'll have someone who's an expert with CAD design. And so every week you're getting another idea of where you might go with this new career. The next class, uh, Elements of Design One, is where you really learn the language of design. You learn about balance, rhythm, harmony, positive space, negative space, and how to speak knowledgeably about those things to clients. And it's an introduction to color theory, which is up in the second quarter. And the way we teach color theory is connecting it to how you would use it in an interior of a home. Uh, design communication, too, is a continuation of your drawing and your drafting. And you're really perfecting your skills now. Your perspectives are so beautiful. You're doing axonometrics, which is building a house up so that you could look down into it like a bird's eye view. Um, Elements of design two, you're building three-dimensional models, which you're familiar with because in design communication two, you were doing these three-dimensional axonometric drawings. Uh, then we suggest that you take digital presentation one, where you're learning to use Photoshop and Illustrator. So now you're, you're starting to work on the computer. Almost every single office uses Photoshop and Illustrator. Uh, design Communication 3, a continuation of the first two design communication classes. Uh, you are going to be drawing a home. Uh, you're allowed to change walls around. You're starting to put furniture into the space and you're rendering the space, and you saw Christine's beautiful hand drawings. Um, you're beginning to feel like you're something now. You really have something to show <laughs> if you're going to interview for an internship or for a job. You now have something really solid. Uh, when you get down to, um, well, I skipped over the history. The history of environmental arts. There are four parts to it. This is not like the history that you've had in your undergraduate education. Our history classes are classes where you learn to design in the style of the period that you're studying. So in uh, a certain period, they might really use certain colors certain types of materials, and you're going to do a floor plan, put furniture in, and choose the colors. And we have a wonderful resource library at our uh, school building where all the students are welcome to go into that library, take samples, and keep them. You don't have to return them. All the best firms in town give us their samples that they don't need anymore. And they're beautiful, they're pristine, they've never been used, they just don't need them anymore. So in history one, you are learning from the beginning of time up through Gothic. And uh, you're learning about all the furniture, which wasn't too much during those times, uh, the, their colors, their room layouts. Uh, and there are clients that you might have in the future that like that particular style. So then uh, down in the fourth quarter, you'll see on the bottom is history part two. That's Renaissance Baroque and Rococo. And that was a class I never wanted to take. I kept saying, I don't like all that ormolu and the marquetry and the parquetry. Who can live without all that museum stuff? And I really didn't want to take the class, and I kept it until the end of the program. 
I was so sorry that I didn't take it sooner. It's a fabulous class. Um, it's when all the Renaissance artists were just flourishing, and it's so rich. You go on to History 3, and it's 19th century, and this is when Asian art started pouring into Europe and America, and uh, oh my gosh, the camera was invented, and the Eiffel Tower had been built, so people could go up to the top of the Eiffel Tower with their cameras and take pictures, and there you got that bird's eye view, the same as you drew in your design communication two class. Um, history part four is contemporary. Everything that architects and designers are doing today, and it's, it becomes richer and richer, this history four part, um, because of all of the architects and designers also going into product design and designing furniture which you will be able to do as well because you've learned to draw and to draft and you have creative instincts. So uh, the history classes you can take at any time. Uh, you don't have to take them sequentially. So whenever you have time to take one of those history classes, be sure to take one. The uh, digital presentation two class is where you get to choose whether you want to learn AutoCAD or Revit. And uh, Revit is being used more and more, particularly overseas and for large scale projects. But a lot of the architects and designers, especially here in Los Angeles, are clinging to the AutoCAD. And a lot of residential designers find AutoCAD to be just perfect for them, and it's very good for detailing. The um, surface materials class is the stuff of interior design, and this is what all the architects want to take, because they've learned to use materials that go on the exterior of the building, but they've never learned about all the wonderful materials that go on the inside. And now there's a huge, huge emphasis on environmental factors with materials. Um, and there's also a lot of psychology that goes into selecting your materials. And you'll use your color theory together with selecting the materials. Um, the uh, CAD classes go on to the 3D CAD, uh, where you also get SketchUp, or if you're taking Revit, it's the advanced Revit. So you can design bigger and bigger projects. Uh, Revit is a total building information management system. It does everything for you. You can calculate costs, everything within that program. Uh, the, the one advantage that I like with Revit is that if you make an error on one page of your project and correct it, it will auto-correct every single page in your project. So it eliminates a lot of erasing, which is very good. The um, Interior Architecture Studio One is the first class where you're going to be coming up with a concept and you're taught about concept. So you'll come up with a concept for a hotel and you will design the lobby of the hotel. You're now learning about space planning. You're learning about codes. You will design a restaurant to go with that hotel. And you'll also design three categories of guest rooms for that hotel. So it's all very exciting. You're not yet using the furniture and the materials in Studio One. But Following Studio One is Studio Two, and this is where you uh, you saw the image of Christine's uh, Studio Two project. It's a two-story loft, usually. Um, every student's project looks different. No two projects are ever the same. 
a student gets to select their own client and you will design a home for this client who's usually a well-known figure. You'll design an office, a home office for that client. And if the client has a particular hobby like um, comic books, you'll, you'll design a room for the comic book collection. If they're big art collectors, you're going to really think hard and create a way for all the artwork to be displayed. It can't all go on the walls. And you are selecting all of the materials for all the rooms. You're selecting all the furniture. And you are learning how to build staircases. And again, you're going to be learning codes, which is so, so important. Um, that pretty much is the foundation level, and you, you saw where it can lead. And Christine is already <laughs> at the end, four weeks to go, and I can't believe you're almost done. <laughs> um, but you, you will be thinking like a designer. You'll be speaking like a designer, and you will have the confidence to speak to new clients. And clients will respect you because you know what you're talking about. Oops, I keep going to the wrong one. So uh, again, there are 18 classes, uh, it's 82 units in total, and it can be completed in one and a half years. This is if you're not working and you don't have a bunch of kids running around the house. Um, you can take one class a quarter, or you can take two classes a quarter, or you can take three classes a quarter. We don't suggest that you take more than three because there is a lot of homework time. Um, the certificate Certificate program offers open enrollment. All you have to do is, uh, Jeff Daniels once said, all you have to have is a heartbeat, a credit card, <laughs> and a computer, and you enroll. <laughs> and um, there are online classes available too. Not every single class is offered online, but there are some online classes. We have many students who drive long, long distance to come to school, and if they can find an online class, let's say with AutoCAD or with Revit or with SketchUp, sometimes it's good. It, it works out well. It depends on your personality. Some people learn better in a classroom situation. Some people are fine with learning by watching the computer. Uh, the beauty of the online classes is that the classes uh, will stay on your computer the entire quarter. So you can always go back and review. Sometimes when an uh, instructor is lecturing in class and demonstrating, you're so engrossed you forget to write everything down. And you go home to do the homework and you say, oh my god, what, did, what, what do I do? But if you're doing it online, you can go back and review the slides and see what you're supposed to do. So. Um, that's the only thing I can find that's good about online. I'm, I, I'm a people person, but everyone is different. So um, as uh, Larry and Jeff have said, uh, our instructors are just amazing. They're all working professionals. They're coming from their offices. They're not lecturing to you from an old textbook. They, they'll come into class Sometimes they're so tired when they arrive, and then they look at the faces of the students, and they get all energized, and they say, you know what happened in my office today? Well, I had a client, and, and you're getting all this real-life experience. It's, it's not just read to you. Uh, the uh, students, who, uh, or the prospective students who come to the open house usually ask a question about getting certified afterwards. And so there is the NCIDQ 
exam, which stands for National Council for Interior Design Qualification. Uh, this is a very important exam that will separate you from people who have not had design education. So if you already have a bachelor's degree and you go through the advanced program, the master's program, you need to work for two years before you can qualify to sit for the exam. If you finish the foundation level program, you need to work for three years before you can qualify to sit for the exam. I passed it, you can too. <laughs> so the, uh, the foundation level program is approximately $14,900. You pay for each class as you enroll in it, so you're not paying for a year in advance. Uh, if you have to take off a quarter, you can take off a quarter uh, and then come right back in where you left off. And you haven't lost any money by having paid for that quarter in advance. There is a candidacy fee. By the time you've taken your fifth class, you should know whether or not this program is answering your needs. If it is, you'll want to become a candidate. In the program, it's $250. It's good for a lifetime. Uh, if you don't pay the $250, you will never get your certificate upon graduation. But you get a lot of benefits with that uh, candidacy fee. Uh, you, you get to see me all the time. <laughs> You'll have access to our career site, which lists internships and jobs that are available. Uh, a lot of times, firms will call me directly, and I'll put it into this career site. Uh, sometimes firms now, they're getting used to this, uh, they will go directly to the career, uh, career site and they will put all the information on themselves. So I think right now we have about uh, six pages uh, and it's online and about 20 entries on each page. And so we keep the entries there for six weeks before we delete them. Unless the firm tells us, oh, we filled the position already and it only took one week. And so then we'll take that offering down. Um, I mentioned the resource library. All candidate students get to use the resource library, but more than that, they can become a librarian in that resource library. So if you love surface materials, uh, you can work in our resource library. You will get $400 toward another class, and you work for four and a half hours once a week in uh, an 11-week period by doing that. Um, you can become a teaching assistant for an instructor, and uh, with that, you also earn $400 credit towards another class in the program. Uh, so students who complete the certificate with a grade point average of 3.0 or better, it's B average, uh, and you already have a bachelor's degree. The bachelor's degree can be in any area at all, but because you've had the foundation level program, you're eligible to apply for the master's degree program. So now this is the part that Jeff likes the best, the master's degree. <laughs> it's the advanced level, and it really does become more architectural, but yet it is interiors. So uh, there are 11 required classes, plus you will need some elective classes. Of course, the required classes are great. Uh, you will be doing studio classes that are unbelievable. You, you will not believe it when you see what you've done. Um, the elective classes are things like uh, what Alice teaches, residential remodeling. Uh, we, we have um, 
uh, interior design law. Uh, oh my goodness, what are some of our other classes? Okay, winding up. <laughs> okay. Oh, here they are. <laughs> So advanced portfolio and presentation techniques. Uh, we have a new instructor now who's a graduate of the program. Um, he is now teaching a class of advanced rendering techniques using 3D Studio Max and V-Ray. And he taught the students in 11 weeks how to use 3D Studio Max and V-Ray and come up with the most amazing portfolios. Um, photographing architecture and interiors is all online. Accessories for residential interiors for people who prefer the decorative part of interior design, uh, and so on. So, uh, for admission to the master's degree program, uh, you need to have a prior bachelor's degree. And as we said, it can be in any area whatsoever. Uh, and the equivalent of the foundation level program. So if you had the equivalent of our foundation level program at another school and want to transfer into our master's program, you'll send your transcripts to me with course descriptions and I'll evaluate them and let you know if you're ready to start, and then you can apply. Uh, the application uh, for enrollment to the master's program is online, and it does go through Cal Poly's system. Uh, we are a collaborative program with Cal Poly Pomona. The actual degree comes from Cal Poly Pomona. All of the classes are taught here in Westwood, so uh, you don't have to travel out to Pomona. Uh, you can apply in any quarter except summer for the master's program. Okay, so um, 11 courses plus uh, the electives. You must maintain a 3.0 GPA throughout the master's degree program. And the approximate cost of the master's program is 31,500 in total. And uh, the master's program does qualify for federal loans. I think you're familiar with FAFSA uh, as the federal loan program. Well, I made it, and so did you. You stuck with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Suzanne. Uh, that was also wow, you know. I just don't know how to say it. So now we're going to have Vince, and he's going to do the, mm -hmm. the drawing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a Q&A session in just a minute, but we're going to do a quick drawing for a free course, so everybody should have gotten a ticket. So let's have a pick a winner. Maybe Alice, you want to pick the winner? Thank you. All right, everyone has their ticket? All right, here we go. 014691. We're a winner? All right, uh, congratulations. All right, just come see me afterwards and we'll get you all set up. And so now I'd like to invite all of our guest speakers to the front. We'll have a Q&A session. And so we'll, uh, we'll start taking questions. This takes about a minute for the first one, and then the kind of dam opens. So, yes, ma'am. I'm wondering about how these topics are into the application of interior design. Okay, the question is, how do the classes prepare you for the business side of design? And uh, we didn't have time to go into each and every class, but there are specific classes on that very topic. And so there's, a, there's two classes that are actually dedicated to 
uh, how you structure a business, how you do, you know, keep track of time, invoicing, uh, all, all that sort of thing, how, what the contractual arrangements are for designers, as well as how to, uh, we have a follow-up course called Project Management, which helps you understand the nuts and bolts of actually managing uh, one of those projects. Alice, did, did you want to add anything to that? About the business aspects of the what they teach, what we teach as far as business is concerned? Yes. So those two classes actually covers quite a lot. And I think there's also, I'm not sure if that's currently being offered right now for an elective class for contract or legal. Yeah. Interior design law. Yes, interior design law. So then there is also classes for that as well. Are those only in the advanced program or are they in the program? The, uh, Suzanne? The interior. The question was, I'm sorry, the question was, that are those, in which part of the program do those business classes fall in the right. beginning or the? The, uh, the business strategies and project management are in the advanced level. Uh, interior Design Law 1 and Interior Design Law 2 are actually elective classes, and anyone can take them, and they're great. Yes, sir. Um, specifically about the, the foundations course, I'm just curious, uh, with the open enrollment and uh, limited prereq prerequisites, uh, what is the, can you speak a little bit about um, assessment? Is it a traditional, um, like, 4.0 scale assessment, is there any, are there requirements in order to keep moving forward in the program? Yes, okay, so the question is how does the, how do the uh, assessments work in the, in the foundation level certificate part of the program? And yes, there, there's traditional grading in every course on a, a, a B, C, D uh, scale, which can be translated into, you know, the traditional 4.0 scale. Um, the other part of the question was how do you move forward? There is, there is a sequence that is built into the curriculum and there's a series of uh, prerequisites for most of the courses. I mean, some of the courses don't have prerequisites so you can take them anywhere you want, but there are built-in prerequisites. So for example, in, in order to do the studio classes, you have to have completed all the drawing classes and things of that nature. So there is a built-in structure, although you do have some freedom to uh, jump around, which is very helpful in terms of building a schedule. And that's where students oftentimes uh, want to touch base with Suzanne to say, what, which class would it make the most sense for me to take next? Because I can only take two classes this quarter, but next quarter I can take three, or whatever the, the arrangement might be. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Does the foundation course or program also acknowledge any pre-course work done at a different college? Yes. The, the question is, can you get advanced standing for, for, for work in the, in the uh, certificate program? And yes, you yes, can. You can. And the, the, the gatekeeper of that particular doorway is Suzanne. <laughs> can I follow up? Yes. I'm a work in graphic designer, so I know Photoshop and Illustrator very well. So would that be something I could like play thought of, or just be in your class? Like, how would that work? Uh, you would either email me or uh, come and uh, talk to me. Uh, I need to see the class on a transcript. In, uh, or you can prove it's your profession, you use those skills in your profession, um, then we will substitute that class with something else you might want to take that you can learn something new from. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Okay, I think the question is, is the program more geared towards architecture as opposed to um, more, decorative, more decorative aspects? You know, um, we have students going through this that, that go both ways. And uh, we have some students who 
their ultimate goal really is to do private residences and, um, and focus on that aspect of, of the design world. And then we have others that want to go work in architecture firms, which more and more today have um, their own interior design divisions. And so, you know, I would say there's a, there's a healthy representation of both, but maybe you guys would want to comment on I'd like I'd like to comment a little bit about that, too. When the students just think of interior design as selecting pillows or paint and just finishes, it's one limited factor in the interior design industry. But what I think Jeff has been trying to really gear the program for and why we fought so hard to get the masters is that so many of our clients today want to change their lifestyle through the function uh, of their homes. And so understanding the basic structure and architecture and how you can actually transform a space as an interior designer to change somebody's lifestyle and see what's possible through having those architectural skills for the interiors is a tremendous advantage because sometimes people they want in an addition or in a remodel they want to remove walls. And so it takes you to another level, which also makes the projects a lot more inspiring and fun for uh, everybody involved. Yeah, I also think I, I came into this program wanting to do high-end residential, and it, it, it's what I'm pursuing right now. I do think that there are so many things I didn't realize go into even selecting furniture if that's all you wanted to do. So things like scale you need to understand from a building perspective, also a furnishing perspective, material selection, building perspective, also furniture and decoration um, perspective. And so much of the furnishing and accessorizing are the success of it is determined by the walls around it and the lighting and everything else. So I, it, once you start the program, you realize it is absolutely impossible to separate the two. Yeah, and I think what many folks, uh, it's hard for you to appreciate at this moment before you entered the process is how much your vision of what design actually is will change or evolve as you go through the program. So what you may think is design right now will almost certainly evolve as you, as you learn more and more. And so what you may think is just something decorative, I think, as Christine just, just said, you, you start to learn how interconnected everything really is. Yes, ma'am. Well, based on the curriculum you guys put up there, this doesn't seem like there's really any math or engineering, like, like the physical concepts of the installation. It doesn't seem like there's much. Did we forget to put the differential calculus <laughs> course? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the question was, it, 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 is there any math or engineering in the program? And I would say, you know, you know there's, no, there's no math classes, no. But we do have classes on, uh, on how to use computers, not in terms of programming computers, but in terms of how to use them as tools. And we do have classes on um, the technologies involved in assembling buildings. So, you know, to understand how walls are built, how to detail uh, uh, certain aspects of an interior construction um, that are essential, even though as an interiors professional, you would not be responsible for the shell of the building, you could be responsible for a pretty extensive reworking of the internal uh, uh, arrangements of the building, which, which could involve engineering. But keep in mind, every designer, including uh, uh, all the great architects that you may have heard of, they actually don't do their own engineering. They hire consultants for that stuff. And, and you, would, you would be doing that, too, as, a, as an interiors professional. I'd like to add to that, there, there is a little bit of math, but it's really quite simple. When you get into the studio classes, they want at the fundamental level just to be able to calculate square footages. And it's really just multiplying length times width and then cubic feet. 
So there's maybe two calculations that are quite simple to do. And the extent of that is really tremendous when you're calculating uh, square footage of tile or finishes. And those are very easily explained, nothing to uh, fear. And, uh, but you'll find them to be very helpful. And we do teach that even before you get into the advanced, more advanced classes. Did I tell you that when you learn to draw, you actually learn to calculate square footage? <laughs> <laughs> well, they want it, they want, you know, when you get to the studio classes, they want you to have the skills so you can really get into the fun part of learning design. And so that's why the entry level classes do prepare you. So when you do get to that level, you're not learning how to draw, you're actually learning how to design. Well, one of the things that you will learn in this program is that size actually does matter. <laughs> and, and you have to know the sizes of things, uh, both in terms of their square area, their length, height, depth, et cetera, and in some cases, the volume. So there is some basic math. I would call it more like arithmetic than right. math. And, and the foreign students that come in, if you're using uh, you know, decimals, we do work in fractions. So sometimes I spend a little extra time with the, t the students that are coming from uh, other countries that are working on tenths of an inch, where we're working on fractions of an inch. So, I mean, they're really simple equations that we take care of right away, and it's really uncomplicated. Basically, if you can balance a checkbook, <laughs> you can do the math. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let me see if I, I get this. Your question is how do you, is it possible to go straight into the master's program? It, it is possible, and we do have uh, some students that do that, but they have to come with uh, some considerable uh, background in design. So, you know, if you've done a program, uh, if you've done a bachelor's degree in interior design, or if you've done an architecture program, we have and quite a few students who have done that and actually gone straight into the master's program. Or in some cases, they just need to take one or two of our certificate classes to complete whatever it is they hadn't quite finished, and then they can start the master's. So they're almost starting right out. So, so yes, if you have that kind of background, uh, the best thing to do would be to reach out to Suzanne and uh, you know, talk to her about what you've done. W one general rule, we had a question earlier about Photoshop and some of that stuff. The general rule is we, we give credit, if advanced credit, if you can show that you've taken a class similar to that, right? It's, it's not that you, you just say, oh yeah, I know how to do AutoCAD, I don't need that class. You, you, you gotta have the, the transcript that shows you know, that you've done it. And then we're very flexible in that way. Yes, ma'am. OK, I knew someone was going to ask that question. The question is, what percentage of students stop at the foundation level, uh, right? And what are their job opportunities? Um, th that's a hard question for us to answer because you know it's hard for us to keep track of all that. But because the students don't come in discrete cohorts, but more and more of them are going on to do the master's program. I don't know if, if you guys would like to comment on that. I mean, we we here's the thing: we see the program as one program even though it's divided in two for more pragmatic reasons. Some students do choose to stop at the end of the certificate because they say, well, I can get a job with what I already know. And in, in a way, you might say we're victims of our own success because the first part of the program is so good that students come away with a whole bunch of uh, uh, very valuable skills 
they can go out and get jobs. And so uh, many of them do. <laughs> and, and, um, but what we try to remind people of is that getting the first job maybe shouldn't be your only goal, right? That, that even though you can go out and get that first job, maybe you have to aspire to something a little greater than that because after a few years, you may discover that people are passing you by because they actually have the more advanced credential. And you know, there's not one rule that suits everybody, but it's something to think about. So I would say that, yes, some of our students do, you know, do that. But we encourage people to really think long and hard about doing the whole thing. Because that's where you really get the, uh, I would say, the wings, if you want to think of it that way, to fly wherever you want to go. I also, um, because I'm finishing up and I have a lot of um, uh, other students who I've been taking classes with the whole way through. Um, a lot of them do go right on, and especially if there's an interest in commercial and hospitality, and also other students financially need to stop going full-time, and they start working and then go part-time to the master's. I personally went full-time through this program. I need to financially make money now, um, and I'm going to work on building my business for a year and then go back and do the master's part-time because I want to be able to get the NCIDQ. I want to have the ability to move into hospitality um, when I'm ready, and I want to have the flexibility. And so the great thing about UCLA's program is you can take so many different paths, and you can start the certificate program and don't have to make a decision about the master's. You can finish the certificate program and you don't have to have a firm decision on the masters. It is a lot of work. So if you're in your mid 30s like me and you've been doing school for 2 years and you love to work, you know, you have the flexibility to strike the right balance at each point in your life. So on that topic, yes. for those of us who don't have a bachelor's degree, do you see it as beneficial to do the certificate course or go for the bachelor's to start with? Maybe you know, I, I've been asked that question. The question is, what about those of you who may not have a bachelor's? What, what, what are your options? Well, you, you know, one option would be to just do the certificate program and, and do the best you can. Uh, uh, and you would not be alone in, in, in taking that approach. However, my advice to you, not to get too you know, parental about this, but my advice is whatever you decide to do about our program, you should go get your bachelor's degree. Because uh, it's the thing that I think you may regret later on if you haven't ever done that. Now, you may say, well, what about Bill Gates? What about Steve Jobs? What about uh, uh, Evan Spiegel? What about all these guys? They didn't finish their bachelor's degree. Well, OK, if you think you're in that category, <laughs> go for it. You know, But uh, not everybody is. And I think the, the conventional wisdom is, you're going to be in a lot better position and have a lot more choices in life in general with a bachelor's degree. And one of those choices would be you could go on and complete our entire program. Uh, but, you know, so I really am, am a fan of, of getting that degree because I think it's, it's very valuable for most people. And you know, even the Bill Gateses and people, you know, they got them honorarily later. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> they just went a little bit different route. And and actually, there's a guy now. Um, gosh, which one of them was it? I think it's Evan Spiegel. Do you all know who Evan, Evan Spiegel is? The is the guy who founded uh, Snapchat. He dropped out of Stanford. I don't know in his second or third year, something like that. And he's now worth you know, over $4 billion. And he's only, I don't even think he's 30 yet. And um, 
he just, you know, he just recently got married. And uh, he has a young, uh, at least one young child, if not two. And he said that he's going back to finish his Stanford units to get his degree because he wants to set an example for his young children later on uh, when they're old enough to do that. So, you know, uh, uh, take that for what it's <laughs> worth. But, you know, that's a pretty powerful story. Does that answer your question? Come on, give us a <laughs> How about a tough question now? <laughs> oh, yes, ma'am. I don't know if this is going to be tough enough, but I'm just wondering if you can, I know every class is different, but how many hours um, of work do you think you would expect you would be, you know, working or doing outside of class? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, let me just uh, restate the question. So, so the question is, how much time is spent outside of class on homework? Who, who would like to take that? Um, so it does depend on the class, but I have not been in a single class that isn't work. Um, the history classes tend to be a little bit lighter um, because you're learning and kind of memorizing as you go. Um, but anything that is a studio class is a lot of work. I would say you can get by maybe with 10 hours on top of the class each week. Um, but if you are a true perfectionist like me, you can end up spending 20 hours on a class in a week um, because you get really, really involved in the work. Um, and if you love it, it doesn't actually feel like work, um, but it does take a big time commitment. And I have two young children at home. Um, when I quit my job, I took them out of their preschools um, to reduce the amount of money we were spending on them. And I had them home with me during the day, and then my husband would take them, and I would go to class at night. And I would work on the weekends and um, nights I didn't have class, and I was able to do that. But I did work from 7.30 when they went to bed until 2 a.m. most nights. Um, to make it happen. So from an instructor point of view, I always ask the students when we do the critiques, when we pin up the work, and the work is on the board, and we stand back and we say, which drawings stand out? And we look at them, and some of them really are quite exceptional, and some of them get by, and some of them are incomplete. But when you ask the, the students when they turn in their work and you say, well, how much hours did you spend on your homework? And it could be like an amazing, like best drawing of the week. They don't say it took them that long because it, it, it really depends on how you get organized, how you set up your work habits, how you uh, follow the instructions. So I find that it's a very personal amount of time for each student. And I find that the busier the people are that take my classes, they get their work done quicker because they know how to go right to the heart of the assignment. They don't fool around. They, they, and I also teach a lot of what I call time-saving skills. That's why I like teaching the, the fundamental classes. If you can really eliminate the bad habits and really that system of success that I talked about, you set up a pattern of how you structure your, your work. So I think some students take longer to do things, but if you're an organized person and you feel like you can understand the concepts and get to the heart of it, you can, you can fulfill the assignments and if you have the extra time, you could really make them exceptional. Depends on, on each student. I would definitely help you select your classes like that. I can tell you that when um, I was a student, every night between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. in the morning, I locked myself in the bathroom with a portable drafting <laughs> board. <laughs> and the kids knew, when mom closes the bathroom door, you can't bother her. And so every night for those hours, I did my homework. 
And sometimes on weekends, I did extra reading and put in more time. But I, it didn't feel like work, because I, I really was loving the, the result of what I was doing. That's very true. I mean, the students that do put the extra effort in, they're, they're just they're just appreciating what they're creating, and they're, they know they're building their skills. So look, it's going to be personal, but uh, there's ways to um, structure your projects where you can get everything done and satisfy the, the class. You can tape a history lecture and listen to it in your car while you're driving to class. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add to that. Yes. So just like she said, I mean, in reality, it's a lot of work. And if you think about it, this is really not an engineer class or a math class, right? You understand the concept, you do your homework, you're done, and you can actually calculate the hours. This is actually art, design. So in reality, when you go to work, I think Career-wise, it's never, ever ending. If this is really your passion, you'll find yourself actually working, be drawing something in the shower when everything is all fogged up, having a little <laughs> notepad by the side of your bed, you know, and, and it consumes you. Because when you design something, you actually, your brain can't stop until the project is finished. And at school, there is final, so you actually can, you know, it will actually have to put a stop. But I think the program is very regular. It's just so hard and actually prep you what's coming up in your career. Because in this career, project has deadlines. And clients hire you. You ask them when's the deadline. They say last month. So you really have to get on it. So I think the, the, pro the program really help you develop a good you know, work ethic. Yes. I have another question on just in regard to placement. It might be two-parted. One is how early within, as we're completing the program, can we be eligible for maybe placement within opportunities that would allow for us to come in at that level of experience? And then second to that, if there isn't an opportunity for that, do you guys have a point of view on those of us who have, like Christine, like completely changed their career and have decided that we're going to focus on this? Like, is there a path we should be thinking of? Should we be working at furniture stores? Should we be trying to do internships? Like, is there anything that you could give any of us who have made like a career change, an idea of where we should be spending our time even outside of the school and the project so that we can be fully immersed? Okay, let, let, let me just restate the question yeah. just for the, the taping. So um, the question is, uh, how, how, when, at what point in the program would one be eligible for an internship? Right or a job placement, and what type of uh, internship or job should you should you aspire to? Right? Is that the question? Yeah. The second part is more: if we're not eligible, what should we be doing on our own to be putting ourselves in certain environments? In from your perspective, I mean, outside of our well, well, you know, doing the program is what makes you eligible, but Suzanne, do you want to respond to the options that are, and, and when there are, I mean, if I can may yeah. just quickly say one, one quick anecdote, you know, uh, you're, you're basically eligible whenever you're ready, and that, that, that sounds like a cop-out, but it's not, because it's different for everybody. My favorite story about this is we had a guy uh, who started the program, he had absolutely no background in design. I think he came out of the oil business. He was an oil engineer. He was an oil, a petroleum engineer, okay? I don't know if Larry remembers him, but I'm sure he didn't know how to draw. Well, he did take my design communication class, and he was quite intellectual. And Well, well anyway, the funny part of this story is he took the very first class, the fundamentals uh, of interior architecture, which is designed specially to be very fun and easy. There's not a lot of homework. There's just one final project where you select you know, a designer that you are inspired by, and you create a kind of a, an atmospheric board uh, themed around this designer and his or her work. 
And so this guy, this is his very first class, never had any design background. He made his board. He chose the well-known French designer named Philippe Stark. Okay, I don't know how many of you guys know who that is, but he's probably one of the most famous designers of our time. And he, you know, designs everything from hotels to yachts to, to, and he travels around the world constantly. And it just so happened that at this time, he had an office here in LA because they were doing a big hotel project. The on, SLS Hotel. The SLS Hotel on La Cienega. And um, this guy is on a jet, you know, every other day. And so Suzanne, he went to Suzanne and he said, I need a, I want an internship. I want, I want right? to see what it's really like in and, the real and, world. And I think she probably almost, I'm guessing, she probably almost tried to dissuade him because he didn't have any skills. He really. just had this one board. He just had this one show. homework assignment he done <laughs> for the easiest class in the program, okay? And, and he wanted an internship. But I, so I guess he had some, yeah. some level of confidence, yeah, right? Yeah, he did. And so, <laughs> so Suzanne said, well, it just so happens that I got a call from the F -E -E. office. The, the what? It was S-B-E. OK, this office that Philippe Stark was collaborating with right. on these hotels. And she sent him over there with the board. And he leaves the board there. And it just so happens that on this particular day, for, for, for who knows what reason, Philippe Stark himself is in the <laughs> office, OK? <laughs> and he sees this board that is dedicated to none other than himself. <laughs> <laughs> and he's thinking, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and he hires the guy on the spot. The, the, the student called me from the room um, after he was accepted, and he said, Suzanne. <laughs> and I said, who is this? <laughs> so he said, I am breathing the same air <laughs> as Philippe Stark. <laughs> so Philippe Stark gave him a shopping list with no budget and told him to go and find all these things. They were going to go into the lobby of the hotel. The student didn't even know where to start, where to go. So he went to the Pacific Design Center, and he went to all the showrooms along Beverly Boulevard and along Melrose Avenue and up La Cienega. And he selected everything he liked. If you ever go into the SLS hotel in the lobby, there is such uh, a mishmash <laughs> of styles, but it's brilliantly put together. It's different from any other hotel, and it's very successful. So anyway, it, this is a wonderful story, but to, to answer your question is it just depends, really, you know? And it's hard to say, oh, there's a rule. It, it does depend on what your interests are. It depends on, you know, it, it's obviously you have a better chance of being uh, taken for an internship if you do have, if you've taken enough classes, so you have some drawing skills, you maybe have some you know, m awareness about materials, you have some awareness of the different showrooms that are out there. You know, so uh, you know, this guy was, was, was kind of lucky. But, lucky. <laughs> but, but, um, you know, I, but I would say you know, if you're, what do you guys think about the, all this? I did three internships. And I think internship in this program is actually a big plus. I mean, you're not required to do three. But then the thing is, you have a resume, right? If you start working, you don't want to jump ship every three months, you know, something that you're not interested in. And actually, in the interior design industry, there's quite a lot of firm that practice in many, many different areas, from residential to hospitality, um, even set design. So I think utilizing internship, our connection with all of these little firms, you get to have a little taste for three months at a time before you actually commit to something prior to graduation. So, so I have a story about uh, internships and jobs related to being students at UCLA. Um, Suzanne showed a slide uh, image on the board that showed all the major design firms in LA. 
And I design international hotels, and a lot of times we collaborate with these, we, with these firms. And every time I walk into one of the offices, I go, I know you, where do I know you from? And it was students that I had from UCLA. So um, I see people on the street, they stop me, they recognize me, and I ask them where they're working. So I've always told my students there's always a place for good, great students. And you know, every time I say that to inspire people, I mean it because one of my professors when I was in college, I had the same question. I said, how do I make it in this? Is there going to be jobs? And he said, there's always going to be a job for good, great people. And if you want to be at that level and you want to achieve something, uh, there really isn't anything that's going to stop you. Because I, I wasn't stopped. I had a goal. I wanted to be successful. And I was able to achieve my goals. And so when I see my students in these uh, offices working on these projects, they might be in the FF&E department. They might be um, a design manager. They might even be a director. But you see them. Some of our students have, have been hosts on TV shows, on, on channels. So we have a, a, a really great track record. And I know personally that I've seen my students in really great positions. And you know, one last thought on this, because it's a great question, is you know, my advice would be Take the first class, the Fundamentals of Interior Architecture. What's nice about that class is not only is it easy, and not only did it help this one guy get a job with Philip Star, <laughs> but um, what it, what it, 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 uh, a lot of the class is guest uh, presentations and lectures from outside designers who come in and talk about the kind of work that they do. So you're going to get a kind of overview of the local industry here in a very, very interesting way. And this class will, first of all, it'll, it'll help you know how you feel about going back to school at all, right? And having to be on a schedule and, and with classes in the evening and all that stuff. And it will give you a very uh, broad sense of, of what the industry is doing uh, today. It's very current. And so from that class, uh, I think you would get a terrific idea of, you know, does this program make sense for you? Is it something you could feel yourself getting excited about? What kinds of design firms are out there that you might be interested in targeting with, with an internship or whatever? And, and how best to prepare yourself for, for you, what you really want, as opposed to what you know someone else wants. Yes, sir. Um, on a practical level, if, if somebody's an undergraduate, you don't have to pay to get an internship. Um, you either have paid internship or, or they're getting class credit. They're getting three units or something for a, a semester, quarter uh, internship. In, since it, most of the people in certificate program right now already have their BA. They're presumably working during the day. So how are those internships? How does that work? You know, most, most businesses are open during daylight hours, not during the day. OK, so the, uh, again, I'm just going to repeat the question. So the question is, if you're working at a full-time job when you're going through the program, how would you, how could you be considered for an internship? Does anybody want to take that? Well, some students make certain arrangements with their employers uh, to be absent from their job two days a week. An internship is usually eight hours a day, two days a week for a three-month period, almost three months. So uh, some people are not ever able to do an internship. But if you really want one badly enough, and if you're honest with your employer, you can arrange it. Yeah, that's the other thing. The internship is not a requirement to complete the program. It's, it's an option. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, it, it, it's a very good option, but it may not work for everyone. Or maybe you can come up with some compromise, like right. Suzanne is talking about. Uh, so some people just start out in a job. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I left my job, but in return, I had my kids home with me full time, so an internship wasn't available to me either way I did it. Um, but 
you build a really good portfolio taking the classes. So you, you can interview for jobs, and a lot of the people around me, that's exactly what they're doing. Um, and um, you do walk out with a really good portfolio, so by the time you finish your certificate program, if you want to make the leap to the master's, but you need to carry a job, it, it's feasible. Um, but it is a change, you know, you're, depending on where, where you're at in your career. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that, that has several parts to that question. So uh, uh, the first part was, what kinds of projects do you do in the advanced master's part of the, stu the studios? And um, uh, you do a variety of things. Uh, I believe in Studio A now, they're often doing a, um, it's a combined marketplace and- um, Art gallery and a cafe. An art gallery and cafe. Uh, on, on multiple levels. Um, I think Studio B is often a workplace type of environment, mm -hmm. um, you know, like a, a, an office for some mm -hmm. sort of a large company, yes. probably in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, probably six or 7,000 square feet, something like that. Yes, and, and uh, environmental issues, excuse me, environmental issues are a very important part of right. these studio classes. Right, and then in the, uh, the thesis, of course, is, is uh, you get to select that. That's sort of a little more complicated story. The thesis is really a year-long uh, culminating experience where the first part, you're actually researching the topic itself. In other words, determining what you want the project to be, finding the relevant information, finding an appropriate building and location for that use, and, and kind of mapping out what you want to do. Then, and, and students do all sorts of things, from, from hotels to uh, healthcare facilities to uh, schools, uh, uh, shelters, restaurants, all sorts of projects. And then you, the second part is, is the design itself, where you actually go into doing all the design drawings and models and stuff like that. And then the final part, uh, which is quite interesting, is the, and this is something that's quite unique to our program, which is you take that design that you've now developed and you do a complete set of technical construction documents for that project, just as you would do in a real office. And I can tell you, that uh, when firms, when our students walk in with uh, a, a roll of drawings that they've done, that final bit of the thesis, you know, they 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 close the deal. They get the job right then and there because these these construction document packages that our students do, in some cases, are better than what the offices that are hiring them actually are used to producing. And so um, that's kind of the core part of it. What, what was the other part? What, what technology do they use? I'm kind of answering my questions about the hand drafting, but specifically, do you know if the students in the master's program usually have a resident? Yeah, well, this, the, the master's program, uh, by the time you're in that, doing that project, you've, you've taken the AutoCAD, you've, you may have taken Revit. Uh, the, the three programs that people use most are uh, SketchUp, AutoCAD, and Revit. And, and uh, we get this question constantly, well, if I have to choose between AutoCAD and Revit, which one should I learn? And the best answer, unfortunately for you, is you need both. Uh, because if you really want to be, uh, the students who get the highest paying offers once they get out of the program are the students who have the full, fullest range of skills, right? Or, or proficiency in the fullest range of skills. And that goes from hand drawing right up through the digital skills, including even you know, Photoshop and Illustrator, because and, we have classes in all those things. And you really need the full package to be, um, you know, to compete, right? 
You can get a job with less than that, but if you want to get the best job at the best salary, that's really what you want to go for. And, and we always encourage the students, whatever tools they've learned throughout the beginning courses all the way through to the master's program, use the best tools you have available to you to make your projects efficient, stand out from the crowd, and really be get the person's attention because presentation skills are a dynamic way to really uh, get your point across. Design intent, sense of place, all these um, important issues are just how you use the tools we teach you here. And hopefully by that level, you have a good toolbox you can pick and choose and really create these um, really sellable tools. Yes, sir. Are people on an F2 visa allowed to enroll? Um, when you uh, come into the program, you get an F1 visa uh, as an international student. So uh, the F2 is, uh, means what? So the, the F2 is um, you're the dependent of someone that has F1? Oh, yes, you can enroll. Well, you have F2. well, you would go to our international student office. Uh, the, the advisors in that office are, are really very, very good. And uh, they'll get you set up. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, so the question is, uh, how much of the program uh, is geared for uh, um, green. green design and preparation for the lead test? We, we have a specific course dedicated to that, and it's something that is um, kind of woven into many parts of the program, most of the studios, uh, because it's just woven into every part of our lives now. And so I would say that uh, we emphasize it uh, quite a lot, and, and we'll be emphasizing it more and more as time goes on. So, so yes, it is an integral part of the curriculum. Uh, there is a required class on the master's level called the Ecology of Design. And then are you prepared to take the test then? Well, uh, we don't specific. The question about the, the LEED yeah. certification, well, you know, there's many different LEEDs. Right certifications mm -hmm. and you know we don't specifically prep students for yeah. that you but have to study on your own okay. I mean yeah because it's just basically memorization of what type of lead that you wanted to take so I, I took the lead AP exam when I was working for okay. at an architectural firm however the NCIDQ exam is basically the whole entire program is prepping you for that one exam from the beginning all the way towards the end yeah, and I would say the NCIDQ is a more important, I mean, it's not to make it sound like, oh, lead is not important, but you know, for, for your professional standing, the NCIDQ is more, is the thing you should do first. And, and you can always add the lead certification, you know, after. And in California, Title 24, which is a code requirement, I mean, they've gotten so efficient with the use of electricity, the amount of windows. I mean, even though we're not LEED certified, the requirements for projects today have gotten quite sophisticated. Uh, light switches that turn themselves off. A lot of things that you'll learn as you go through. And, but it, it, is, it is interesting to see, if you've been in the business a long time, how important, like LEED was a very marketable tool People were talking about it a lot, and I think a certain segment, it's required. And so it's good to know, but it's not required on every project you work on. Well, but having said that, the codes themselves now are getting more and more stringent. And so, for example, very soon, you're not going to be able to build a new house in California without solar panels and a lot of other things. So. Um, you know, it's sort of an open question as to how valuable LEED certification is 
if every project's required to do it anyway, it doesn't necessarily differentiate you as much as it once did when in the early days of, of green design. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Jeffrey. I see that in the building departments on all of our projects. They're getting more, uh, all the, the basic laws for all projects are getting tougher. Yes, ma'am. I have three questions. Three. Okay, let's start with <laughs> question number one. Okay, uh, Suzanne could probably answer that. But the question is, wh how, what do you have to do to be ready to take the NCIDQ in terms of work experience? It, it, it's, there's a kind of complicated formula between <laughs> education, amount of education, and number of years that you've worked, Correct. right? Correct. Uh, for the master's program, uh, because you already have a bachelor's degree, it would take two years of actual work experience, not internship, but work experience before you're qualified to sit to take that exam. If you're going to go through the foundation level program and want to become NCIDQ certified, it takes three years of actual work experience in order to sit for the exam. I'm going to add to that. So. For the person to sign off, either had to be a licensed architect or another licensed interior designer. So if you actually have plans to take your NCIDQ after graduation, you have to actually pick your firm carefully. As far as the hours adding up, part of the hours when you're in school, if you're doing an internship under a licensed architect or interior design firm, those hours still count. So a lot of times, even you have two years that you have to accumulate, not necessarily it's going to be at the same job. So if you plan to do this, just start having your supervisor signing off your hours as you move forward. Don't wait until the last minute. Yeah. Right. Okay, so AutoCAD and Revit, it looks like on a master's program, you can only take one or the other. Is, there, is it possible to take both? The question is, can you take both Revit and AutoCAD? And the answer is yes. It is, uh, l let me put it to you this way, you're only required to take one, but we would encourage you to take both. Okay. And then what's the income range for someone who just takes the basic certificate course versus somebody who does the master's program? What's the income range for both, right out of um, both of those programs? <laughs> Do you want to take it's a stab kind of, at that, Suzanne? I'll take a stab. Um, it really varies. It depends what kind of firm. Uh, the question, uh, sorry, the question is what is the uh, earning capacity of someone who just finished the certificate program versus someone who finished the master's program? Um, for someone uh, who's uh, coming out of the foundation level program and going into their first job, it's um, usually a residential type uh, firm, and depending upon your computer skills, uh, you would probably start somewhere around twenty-two to twenty-eight dollars an hour. Um, the advanced level, the master's program, coming out of that, if your uh, computer skills are really good and your portfolio is strong. Uh, it depends on the firm again, but usually those students start in the mid to high $40,000 range up to, we've had some students start at $70,000 a year. If their work is so strong that they're hired at a higher uh, level, like a senior, we did have a uh, student who graduated his first job was with the firm HOK. They took one look at his portfolio and, they, and his construction documents is what really did it. He was hired, I'm talking about Zia. Mm. He was hired at $70,000 a year as a senior designer. That does not happen very often, but it can. And that was a few years ago. Uh-huh. He now owns his own firm. Can I, can I make a, 
observation in the industry too, as you see the industry grow and spread out, there's a certain select group of designers, the way that they really get the highest pay is they work for a firm, they build their skills, and they go to another firm. And I've seen you know, people that I've worked with over the years, they jump firms every couple of three years, and, but their skills levels, they, they end up, they know how to maximize their, their salaries. And sometimes when you stay with a firm too long, you can't really do that. So, you know, it's like the loyalty in the industry when there's a lot of jobs out there, people do move around for these positions. And it just depends on how strong the market is. And if it's a employer's market, you know, they hold your, hold your wages down. If there's a shortage of uh, people because there's too many jobs, you have better chances of getting the, uh, the higher incomes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, the question is, is the grading in the classes based on projects or tests? It depends on the class, uh, but m m the majority of the work is project-based. Yeah, I think in the history classes there are more tests, but in almost every other class, I would say it's project-based, yeah? And, and in my beginning classes, there's vocabulary tests that really test your competency with the uh, concepts. And so you learn the nomenclature, uh, being a designer, being in the design industry. So I really try to help the students build a strong understanding of the correct terminology and the types of drawing. So there are those type of tests, but don't, don't worry because every week we repeat the definitions every week multiple times. And you pretty much have it memorized by the end of the quarter. And so nobody's afraid of taking the test because it's, a, it's always a rep repetition, learning through, uh, just repeating, and it, and it, it helps you uh, be better as you move through the program. Oh, okay. This, this was a great... Uh, well, if there's no more questions, uh, I just want to thank our, our speakers, our panel, and thank you all for being here. We hope to see you soon in a, in a class or two. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>